Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who has made us, and we are his. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Let us praise our God together. Would you take your hymnals and turn to hymn number 53 and let us stand and sing. Let us pray together. Almighty God, Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, our King, our Lord, our Creator, our Shepherd, our Governor, we praise and worship you this morning. We thank you for this Sabbath day, O Lord, 
set aside to focus on things of eternal significance. And we ask as we gather before you that you would give your Holy Spirit to awaken our hearts and minds to do in us that which we cannot do in or for ourselves. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. Our confession of faith is printed in your bulletin this morning. It is the Nicene Creed. These are the things that bind us together more important than matters of culture or age or even of, of century. These are the truths that God has given to us forever settled. Let us confess our faith using these words. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and of all things visible and invisible and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, the very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory, to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one Catholic and apostolic church I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. So let us respond with praise using hymn number 59. Please be seated. We had the privilege now to draw near to God as one congregation. Would you bow your heads with me then as we pray? Oh,
Almighty and merciful God, you are King of kings and Lord of lords. You are the ancient of days, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. In you all things hold together. And Lord, by the, the Lord Jesus Christ, you have brought life and immortality to life. You have laid aside our sins, having nailed them to the cross. You have punished Christ, the perfect Lamb of God, in our stead. And Lord, we come by that grace with cleansed consciences. And though many of us don't feel clean and holy, and we trust your word that you will not and shall not punish us for our sins, that Christ has borne them and paid them in full. And so, Lord, we come with what remains of sin, asking that you would help us to put it to death. Lord, in thought, word, and deed where we have sinned, we ask that you would forgive us, have mercy upon us. And Lord, help us uh, to live in joy and, and hope and kindness, knowing that you have forever settled the question of our salvation. Lord God, we thank you. And we ask in this hour that you would build us up in knowledge and wisdom and understanding. We live in a dark time. Lord, we live in a time where the gospel advances throughout the nations, but only with great persecution. So, Lord, would you give us wisdom to be wise as serpents, to be innocent as doves. Lord, we ask for hope, uh, for encouragement, knowing your present power at work among us. Lord, that even though it may appear otherwise, you are bringing from every tribe and tongue and nation, from every people group, people uh, to yourself, Lord, we pray that you would do so, that you would use us to that end. Lord, we pray for family members who have strayed, who don't perhaps even know Christ as their Savior, as their Lord. Would you draw them close to you? Have mercy upon them, we pray. Lord, we lift up those in need of healing and comfort. We pray for Gloria Knight and the loss of her sister-in-law. Would you comfort her and her family? We pray for healing for Judy Allen, for Jay Goddard for Chick Dodd, and we remember Caleb Knight and Bob Whitaker's mother. We pray for Louise Schrock, uh, these saints who have undergone either surgeries or afflictions. Would you encourage them? Lord, we pray and thank you that you've entrusted us with the ministry of the gospel. And Lord, we thank you for it. Would you bless all of our summer ministries as we look to June, July, and August? We pray for our Wednesday evening Bible study. Would you bring many out to to study your word and to encourage and build up one another. We pray for our weekly Bible studies, our Sunday school classes. For those who prepare, bless their words, their time, we ask. And Lord, we lift up our Vacation Bible School. We thank you for so many volunteers who work and who uh, present the gospel to children and even to families this time of year. Would you bless and, and encourage our enrollment? Lord, help us to have all the volunteers that we need. Lord, we thank you for those expecting children and pray for them. We lift up the Lou's, the Williams, the Hagans, and we pray for the Adams. Lord, give safe and healthy children, we pray. We lift up those desiring children, Lord, that you would open wombs, that you would provide that great gift of children. Lord, we lift up those desiring to adopt, and we particularly remember the Barry family. Lord, would you comfort them in the recent news. Lord, help them to find another child in the days to come and to provide a home for many children, Lord. God, thank you for this blessing of not only children, but of marriage. We pray for our families, that they would be strong, that there would be love and unity, that you would build up the home. And we pray for those seeking marriage. Would you guide them, Lord, help them to trust you. Lord, help all who will marry to marry in the Lord. Provide that and only that we ask. And we lift up our world, Lord, as we see conflict and war in the Far East. We pray for Ukraine. We pray you continue to sustain them. We thank you for the generous gifts of this church to send relief to these brothers and sisters in Christ. Would you help and bring an end to war? Build your church there, we pray. Lord, we lift up our missionaries, the Calusias in Italy. Would you establish the plant, uh, the church that they desire to plant? Would you be with them and provide all the funds they need. Be with the vicaries in Indonesia as they pastor, as they build up the church there. And for Jonah and Jennifer, thank you for their willingness to go even into difficult places for the land of Pakistan. Would you give wisdom to your churches there? Provide for them in every way. Lord, we pray for our nation finally and ask that you would restrain 
evil, restrain our desires. Bless us as we go to the polls and elect new representatives in the days ahead. Would you, Lord, have mercy upon us, appoint godly men and women, restrain evil, we ask. And Lord, we thank you and ask uh, your blessing as we continue to worship you. Encourage us, build us up in this hour, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. And w welcome all of you who gathered this morning, particularly if you're a visitor, a first time or regular visitor, you have a registration pad before you. This is a good way to get to know those and leave a, a record of your attendance as well. Remind you of uh, the VBS, you'll see an insert in your bulletin, July 6th to 10th, and they do need visitors or, well, they need visitors too, but they need volunteers especially. So if you're willing and able, please make that a part. Uh, you can talk to Matt Ross or Michelle or Bobby Mitchell. And also next Sunday, there is a church-wide luncheon. We do this, I believe, quarterly. And it's a great opportunity to get to know people around you. So join us for that. Bring a dish for your family and maybe to share with others as well. And this time, I'll direct you to page 818 of your uh, hymnal. We'll read together responsively Psalm 94. Page 818, and we read Psalm 94, if you would respond in the bold printed section. O Lord, the God who avenges, O God who avenges, shine forth. How long will the wicked, O Lord, how long will the wicked be jubilant? They crush your people, O oh Lord, they oppress your inheritance. They say the Lord does not see. Take heed, you senseless ones among the people, you fools, when will you become wise? Does he who disciplines nations not punish? Does he who teaches man lack knowledge? Blessed is the man you discipline, O Lord, the man you teach from your law. For the Lord will not reject his people. He will not forsake his inheritance. Who will rise up for me against the wicked? Who will take a stand for me against evildoers? When I said my foot is slipping, your love, O oh Lord, supported me. Can a corrupt throne be allied with you, one that brings on misery by its decrees? But the Lord has become my fortress, and my God, the rock in whom I take refuge. The grass withers, the flowers fall, but the word of our God abides forever. Amen.
Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you today represented by your Son, Jesus Christ, thankful for your many blessings that you've poured out so graciously upon us this week through your hand of providence. We ask, Lord, that your word always be a lamp unto our feet and that we may obey it and be good soldiers for your kingdom and ask that you use your tithes and our offerings to further your kingdom now and forever. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And as you remain standing, our psalm of preparation is in your blue psalms for worship. Psalm 119 in. On the last sands of children can be dismissed to Children's Church. May be seated. Turn with me in your Bibles to the 19th chapter of Acts. We'll look at the first half of that, reading down through verse 20 today, beginning at verse 1. And in our last uh, sermon in this series on the book of Acts, we saw how the Apostle Paul made a whirlwind journey all the way from Ephesus to Caesarea, including stops in Iconium and Lystra and Derby going uh, as far north as, as Antioch and trying to work his way back to Ephesus, Ephesus again. And along the way, this very strong, useful Egyptian convert named Apollos uh, had a few tweaks given to him by the Apostle Paul and Aquila and Priscilla, uh, and he was left uh, in charge uh, of the church there in Corinth as Paul moves on. You should know something about the significance of these two cities, Ephesus and Corinth, major regional capitals of the day, and in those the Apostle Paul spent a long time. Would you hear God's word now with that backdrop, that setting in Acts chapter 19, beginning at verse 1. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed. They answered, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them. They spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there. 
for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. One day, the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and I know about Paul, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. When this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear. And the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed their evil deeds. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly when they calculated the value of the scrolls. The total came to 50,000 drachmas. This way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. Let us pray. Lord, we now bow before you and ask you to still our hearts, to focus our minds, to show us, O oh Lord, your word for us in this day. We thank you for your word that it is without error and true in all its guidance. Amen. Any religion, or for that matter, anything good in life, can be counterfeited. Fakes abound. In an age which Photoshop or deep fake can make almost any scene or photograph look different, phonies seem to multiply. If one is about to purchase a work of art, or some collectible and you think it's authentic, you might want to make sure and verify it before you find out when you get it home that it is a Dollar Tree print. Persons represent themselves as having accomplishments all the time and inflate their resumes which, find, which are found not to be true. Churches too can themselves overpromise in providing for all human needs and often that can lead to disappointments. In religion, if something is good or is doing well, it will be copied. And if imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, in many cases, in spiritual matters, imitation may lead to deception and to many other ills. It will always be important for believers to make sure that we are following and loving the real thing and not a fake. That's another reason. God gives us his word. And in matters of faith, it's like taking a long journey. At the first part of that journey, the slightest deviation from the correct path will lead to many miles of deviation on a long journey. If a ship is leaving a port, it's crucial to be on the right course early on lest many ocean knots have to be regained later on. That is why this chapter and other chapters in here are so important. The Lord does not want his people getting off track. The Lord, our shepherd, loves his sheep enough to guide them and to bring them into the fold, even with his crook and even to discipline us with his rod if we start to stray. Would it not be patently unloving of God to allow us to simply wander and stray, heading in any direction that we think is right according to our own eyes. We need to know the difference then between real spirituality and imitations. And this passage is one that God gives us the differences. First, I want you to see the real thing in the opening 12 verses. 
These verses depict the spreading flame of Christ's church. Remember, as we are studying this from the first week in our series of Acts and, and until here, we're trying to stress that the Lord Jesus in the book of Acts is not different than he was in the Gospels. He has the same character, the same goals, the same plan, the same church. It's only now that he is risen and he has dispersed his power through the church rather than guiding it physically. This could well be the fifth gospel. That's how I'm approaching this book. And the next book, the book of Romans, could easily be the sixth gospel. As the church matures, it works through things. And we saw last week that God raises up more leaders. And chapter 19 then commences by telling us that Apollos, that new leader who had risen up, remains in Corinth he is quickly accepted and recognized as a gifted leader after a few of the corrections and mentoring by Aquila and Priscilla and Paul. And Paul was not jealous of this new young leader. Rather, he rejoiced in that, and that effective leadership began to grow. And the apostle Paul, for him, with his holy restlessness, without having family responsibilities was allowed to follow the Spirit and to travel as a roving ambassador for the things of Christ. Paul took an interior road, according to these verses, as this, as this herald going to Ephesus, the largest city of the region. Ephesus was a major capital of the region in this province of Asia. It was just a few miles off the coast of Asia Minor in what we would call Turkey today. And he had gone to this city. It had been established for over a thousand years. It was an extraordinary city in many ways. Its population, from the best we can tell in this age, was over 300,000, which for that time made this a huge metropolitan area. It had its own government. Uh, it wasn't ruled by the Roman officials. Instead, it had a Greek constitution, and there was a large agora or a public marketplace in which debates and events would be held. And this city of Ephesus hosted a magnificent library, rivaling the library of Alexandria as two of the finest in the day. And of course, it was the location of the famous temple of Artemis, which was one of the seven wonders of the world. And it was in this city eventually where Timothy was sent <clears throat> after Paul left to be the bishop elder of that city. And it was the one in which we're told, according to history, that the apostle John spent five years toward the end of his life. Paul found some folks here. He met some people here that seemed to profess allegiance to Christ. These disciples evidently knew the essentials and the basics of Christianity. But as Paul began to get to know them and talked with them, he recognized a deficiency. <clears throat> We're not sure uh, of all of the details, but he heard a lot, this one name over and over again, he heard a lot about John the Baptist, but he heard very little about Jesus. And so Paul asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Two things are clear from this beginning of his discussion with him. If folks are in error, it is not the loving thing. And Paul did not dare leave these people alone merely to affirm their self-esteem or tell them with a pat on the head that they really were pretty good people. It was not a day of doctrinal relativism. Instead, too much was at stake. And so Paul had to be sure that they were on the right track, drinking in the real thing, not deviating on their long journey. And secondly, also, he had to be faithful to the true faith and not leave out the Holy Spirit. Our faith is Trinitarian through and through. In any age and on any continent, it is not only the person and work of God the Father that matters. It is not only the person and work of Christ the Son, as glorious as He is, that matters, but also the person and work of the Holy Spirit is central and crucial. We cannot 
live our Christianity without the Holy Spirit. Our faith, you see, is an inherently, inescapably Trinitarian with the Holy Spirit having a key role. Perhaps the true test of spirituality you may have, may have heard is that if, if I were to ask you, is there anything in your life that is ongoing now that would stop if there were no Holy Spirit? Or is most of your life explainable in terms of purely human effort and dynamics? Paul knew that for these Christians and for the church of Ephesus to thrive, that they must have the Holy Spirit dwelling in them. It was not by works. It was not even by carefully following the teaching of John the baptizer. And so without insulting them, he calls them to go deeper in the faith. And he says, have you received the Holy Spirit when you believed? May I ask you this morning the obvious question. Have you received the Holy Spirit? It is not too antiquated to ask that question. Have you? Does he live in you? Does he stir you? Does he move you? I didn't say, do you have passions and emotions? Do you get enthusiastic or excited about certain things? Those are works of human flesh at times. Does he call you to repent? And does he give you greater and growing faith? Does he empower you when you're weak? Note, I didn't ask, do you speak in tongues? Do you work great miracles? Do you try hard? But does the Holy Spirit live inside of you for Jesus our Lord? Put things in a clear perspective. Back in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 7, when he said, Not everyone who says unto me, Lord, Lord, will inherit the kingdom of God. But those who do, the works of God. Once a person is baptized into Christ, once a person comes to true saving faith, that person is sealed by the Holy Spirit. And tellingly, these Ephesians answer, we've never heard there was such a thing. And Paul says, well, then what baptism did you receive? And they said, we received John's. It was amazing, actually, that they were still holding to that some 25 years or so after the fact. And yes, the Spirit can actually work even when we're not aware of that. So Paul then begins to explain the real thing further. And he starts by summarizing John's baptism. And he says John's baptism had two major parts. It was a baptism of repentance, that is, turning away from error. That is good. In fact, that theme could be stressed a little more in most of us. How often do you look at your own life and note the need for repentance? Or do you want to see others need for repentance more often than your own? How often do you actually repent or change? The Holy Spirit is needed from that. Do you recall that of the 95 theses of the great reformer Martin Luther, that the first one is that the Christian life is one of continual repentance. That is a regular part of our spirituality, if it is real. When we're baptized into Christ with the Holy Spirit, instead of becoming bombastic or loud or showy or demanding, the Lord actually calls us to repentance, and often. Secondly, John's baptism pointed to someone else in the future, not to himself. The real thing you see is centered on Christ and it involves repentance. The church's message in Acts is actually the same as Jesus's, which in its simplest form was repent for the kingdom of God is near. Now, Paul had an experience as he's traveling his mission journeys, much as many of us do. It may be as if he was a missionary going to the American South. You go to the South and almost everybody thinks they're Christian and says they are. When Paul says, have you received the Holy Spirit since the time you believed? They said, well, we've never heard of such a thing, but we're uh, committed to John's baptism. And if you ask a lot of your neighbors at times, if you ask them, are you a Christian? Often people will say, well, of course, I'm, I'm not a Hindu or I'm not an atheist. And what Paul had noted about these, though, was that there was a 
noticeable lack of the fruit of the Spirit. There was a clear absence of walking depending on the Holy Spirit instead of their own flesh. And he sensed that something was wrong. So he says, if you've not received the Spirit, do so. And while they had been following John, the forerunner to Christ, Paul realized that they needed to be filled with the Spirit and meet the Lord Jesus Christ. There were 12 of these noted here. He laid his hands on them, <clears throat> similar to the 12 disciples. And just like at Pentecost, so now these people began to speak in tongues and they prophesied. Without learning languages, they spoke in dialects that they had not studied, and they proclaimed Christ. Just as in Pentecost, the risen Savior's church is expanding to all nations and all languages. That's the real thing. And God pours out His Spirit on these in Ephesus. The genuineness of the Spirit is spreading, and His church is now empowered by the Holy Spirit. Now, some people, some of our Pentecostal friends, believe this is a second experience and that everyone must have a second experience. But it's actually, I think, the first one because on the basis of Scripture, in Romans chapter 8, verse 9, Paul says, But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. And later in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3 says, No one can say that Jesus Christ is Lord except by the Spirit. So when the person truly comes to Christ, the Spirit indwells that person. And the Holy Spirit brings us to Christ, baptizes us into that. Paul then remains in Ephesus for a period of three months, and he starts preaching in the synagogue pointing to the kingdom of God. Again, note the focus on this is preaching not about human interest or human hobbies or human wants or even human perceived needs, but he's preaching the kingship of God. Effectively, Paul speaks on these themes, and there were conversions, and, and there, there continue to arise problems in this city because there were conversions. For three months he preached in the synagogues and then he had to leave for preaching for three months, divided these people. He was reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God, verse 8 says, and whenever you make it clear that human goodness and works do not merit salvation and that Jesus is the rightful king and Lord, some will not respond in faith and some will. Some will become obedient and follow Christ. Some will be disobedient and speak evil of the way of God's salvation, as you see in verse 9. And often those who oppose the most are those who are most religious. They take pride in their religion. How dare you suggest that we are sinners? How can you possibly say that we're not good enough that our works are not acceptable enough to gain us entry into heaven. Every religion except biblical Christianity appeals to man's pride and his ability by promoting a salvation through human goodness. But the gospel rightly proclaimed says that there are none who are inherently good enough for heaven, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the only way a sinner can be justified is by His grace through the redemption that comes from Jesus Christ. And that message divides people. So Paul vacated the synagogue. <clears throat> he had no choice. He left after three months of reasoning about the kingdom of God, and he goes and gathers down the street to a, a meeting hall named the Hall of Tyrannus, which was once a gathering place for the local philosophers. And as a sign of his effectiveness, Paul remained there for two more years, making Ephesus the single longest residence of the Apostle Paul other than jail. And he taught and evangelized there for almost three years. It's little wonder that Ephesus grew to be a strong church. And the Word of God 
began to spread. And the scripture says all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of God. The real thing is working. The real thing, the Holy Spirit, which takes the words of Jesus and applies that inwardly to thousands and millions, was spreading it. It was powerful. And it would not die or obsolesce. Today, you may rest assured that God is still working. And when he works, the real thing is plenty powerful. So powerful that there's a record here in this passage that any handkerchief or apron or any garment that touched Paul was sent out and it brought healing. Of course, in our day, some of the TV preachers uh, have begun to fake that and charge you for receiving their hankies as if that could heal you. And I probably don't need to say too much more about that except that there is a large difference between the real thing and imposters. Now go to verses 13 and 16. I want you to see there were those, the imposters, who did not like competition. And when they observed how effective Paul was, they thought they could do the same thing and copy his reality. They thought that this was merely some work of a man. Surely they could figure out his success formula and to make copies and they didn't understand of course the working of the Holy Spirit and underestimated what was really going on so they thought they could use some kind of outward program and accomplish the same as Paul. And they began to go around using Christ's name as if it were abracadabra having no idea what they were really dealing with. And they would even say in the name of Jesus note how it's possible to fake this and command the demons to come out. And one particular family led the league in this. A Jewish high priest did this. Imagine how corrupt he would be to copy the Christians and try to do what they did. And actually, this priest didn't do it, but his seven sons did, likely with his permission. And these were the fakes. And guess who knew they were the fakes. The demons are not as ignorant as these folks and their followers. Do you recall how the book of James says that demons even believe and tremble? True faith reacts. How sad for demons to have a better grasp on truth than those who had been brought up in the temple for years. And yet in verse 15, we see that these sons of Sceva are trying to cast out an evil spirit, and he turns on them. These were the imposters going through the motions, trying to copy the techniques of the truly spiritual, but without the Holy Spirit living inside. Which are you? The real thing or a fake? Could you be an observer merely trying to copy the effects of faith? The demons knew this would not work. The demons detected the imposters, and maybe you should think about this before claiming that you know the truth. Maybe you should know that you are playing with dynamite if you profess to know Christ and you're in it for what you can get out of it, whether that be comfort, whether that be assurance or anything in your life. Maybe you should know that there is great danger in faking faith or acting as if you were spiritual and not being so. Look what happens. The man who is possessed with the evil spirit then turns and is empowered by those evil spirits. He jumps on the seven sons of Sceva. That's some supernatural power. He beat them. He trampled them, leaving their clothes ripped apart and left bleeding and naked. And you have to chuckle a bit. When you read what this demon says, when he speaks to these fakes, he says, Jesus, I know. Paul, I know. But who are you? 
And that summarizes the main difference between the Apostle Paul and these Jewish exorcists. Paul was allowing God to work through him for his own glory, but these spiritual charlatans were trying to use God for their own financial profit or prestige. And those who hired the exorcist were trying to use God's power for their own purposes. They wanted to use God. They wanted to use the name of Jesus, almost like an Aladdin's lap, uh, lamp with a genie, and then put it back on its shelf. It's wrong to use God for your own purposes. It's wrong when we attempt to use God and His spiritual power for financial gain. It's wrong when we attempt to use God and manipulate the Scriptures according to what we think they should say or what works. It's wrong when we attempt to use God and dabble in the occult. And look what happens now in, in verses 17 through 20. Look, look how the, the difference between the fake and the real thing is shown and how God uses even this disaster to show how all the more powerful he is in verses 17 through 20. And you'll see what happens when the real power of God breaks up. The onlookers see this. The onlookers see this spectacle. The onlookers see this demon-possessed man turn on the seven sons of Sceva. And they see him beat them and abuse them and leave them in tatters and naked. And the people see this. And the scripture says the Ephesians were seized with fear. They knew this was powerful. Even the unbelievers saw that God had miraculous power and that it would not be faked and they were rightly afraid. When you see the power of God at work, is there ever a hint of fear or reverence in your life for that? Or is it all just humdrum? Not only did they fear God, but they were moved to honor the message of the name of the Lord Jesus. And they came to realize what was true power. Yes, conversions resulted even from this fakery. And when people see the difference they came to faith and they openly confessed their evil deeds. They did not want to suffer the wrath of God poured out on these impostors. They saw that it was better to openly confess that Jesus was Lord than to be diagnosed as having corruption and trying to act outwardly righteous, but only for their own benefit. And not only did they confess their evil deeds, but this is, this is stunning when you go through here and read this, if you'll take these words seriously. Their repentance was so thorough that they did something about it. They took these actions, the following actions, to show that they were separating from their old lifestyles. Those who had practiced sorcery took steps to get rid of their tools of their trade. They knew that they must surrender these things that if Jesus Christ was the power that was being seen before their very eyes, they knew that God was a jealous God who would not share his glory with another. And they knew that they could not continue as they had. And so true repentance is shown. And they brought together all of their occultic writings and burned them publicly. You see, they weren't hedging their bets. They were cleaning house. And when estimated, the amount is stunning. It was calculated that these books came to over 50,000 drachmas. A drachma was a day's wage. Over 50,000 days wages, likely five or six million dollars over a hundred years of typical earnings. But they no longer wanted to be contaminated by these deceptive occultic books, and so they burned them. Let me ask you, have you ever done that? Maybe it's not books on sorcery or magic that are troubling and holding your spiritual growth back. Maybe it's some videos in your home, or maybe it's a website 
or maybe it's some old magazines with lustful pictures, whatever it is. True repentance requires that we turn from our sin and take necessary steps so that you don't go back it again. I heard a preacher illustrate it this week. He said, here's true repentance. A teenage boy realizes he cannot withstand the lustful temptation of pornography on his phone, so he goes and buys an old dumb phone and gets away from that. We will, if we are moved by the Holy Spirit, stay as far away from the sources of temptation, not snuggle up as close as we can. And the false gives way to the true. And in this way, verse 20 says, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. God's power was at work. The real power of Christ is still working in our lives and in our world. It is just that the fake power is not working. Isn't it amazing to see God's power even when counterfeits seek to receive the accolades, God's power spreads and grows. And today, that same Holy Spirit promises, if you love Christ and follow Him, to empower you. Let us pray. We ask you, O oh Lord, to bless these words of Scripture and our thoughts as we've sought to apply them and may we know, O oh Lord, the amazing power of our God that does not end or go out of date. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our hymn of affirmation is singing about the almighty power of God. It's hymn number 119. If you take your green hymnals, let us stand and sing. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. Amen.